Ollie, where does the Brock, the Brock story really begin? It, it, not just with the general, obviously. Prior to him, how many generations of Brocks were there in Guernsey? Well, so, the Guernsey Brock story starts in around 1539, which is the first recording of a Brock in Guernsey. It's a man called Philip Brock. We go generations from there through William Brock, uh, who's the, the considered the head of the family when they um, start becoming more prosperous in the 16th century, and then we run through to um, we run through to John Brock, who is Isaac's father. Uh, John Brock is a merchant. He's living in the town of St Peterport, and he's the uh, he's, he's the owner of a number of part owner of a number of privateering vessels which carry letters of mark from the Crown, King George, uh, during the American Revolutionary Wars to go and, uh, and disrupt American shipping and to disrupt French shipping uh, and Spanish shipping in the Atlantic. So the, the family at that point is, is bringing merchandise back from their privateering expeditions, bringing them into St. Peter Port, splitting the cargoes up, auctioning them off, making a lot of money, passing 40% of that money to the Crown and then keeping the rest, distributing it among the crew and the captain of the vessels, and then obviously the family is taking a lot more. And there are records that show that in one year, one family in Guernsey made £712,000 uh, of money at the time yeah, uh, through privateering and mm -hmm. the mar market forces that, that followed. So it's an immensely prosperous time for the Brock family. Uh, Isaac is born into that period. Um, his brother William goes into the bank, is, goes into the family business, and starts his own bank with a with a colleague, and uh, the, the family is really is doing well at that point. In, in simple terms, and the Brocks at the time of the general's birth were not actually an aristocratic family. They weren't a military family. They weren't grandees in that sense, were they? They were simply they were pe they were local people who had who had exploited well. what what the island could offer in terms of its location close to France, in the Channel, close to England, the tax differences between the jurisdictions around them, very much in the way that it does now from a financial uh, services point of view. It was doing the same thing as in a mercantile sense, and the family were merchants at that point. They weren't they weren't the gentry. They one of my conjectures about. Uh, Brock and about the reason for his military career and that of his brothers and the, the reason for putting his uh, brother Daniel into the legal profession was actually to legitimise what was happening. And you have a merchant family who are making money from uh, privateering. Who it's it's a it's a good trade, but it's not an on it's not a highly honourable trade. Mm. And so the children are put into military service, into the clergy into the legal system in order to legitimise and create a sense of gentr gent gentrification of the family at that point, yes. But, but that makes total sense. I'm sure there are many other families quite like that, um, in England for instance, mm. that this was just going with a different situation. I suppose what I'm leading up to is to say that from all you know, all you have read, the general was not from a military background, so the choice to join the army, do we know if it was his choice? Or do we know if it was family pressure at that time? It's more likely, we can only speculate because there's no do rec doc documents or records that show one way or the other, but he was sent to Southampton for his schooling. Um, he was he was apparently excelled at boxing and at swimming. He was a fit young man. He was a very tall young man. And uh, because his older brothers had been put into the army, William, who is his eldest brother, had taken control of the family business. Daniel, his next brother, had gone into the legal profession, and his next brother down, I think, was John, who had gone into the army. And I think that the destiny of the younger brothers was that they would go into the army. Um, the, at 15, he's, he's sent to the army, or had his, his ensign is purchased by Williams Bank. And at that point, I think it's, it's not necessarily his choice, but I think it's a, a natural understanding that that's what he is going to do. And Presumably, there were no regrets. There are no writings to indicate, "Oh, I hate this life." None at all. It's not for me. You don't. To hear the contrary, you. No, to the contrary. He felt his duty to the crown and to the military service was incredible. Yes. Uh, he, he did. He, he seemed enthusiastic about it. All of his writings home were very, you know, very much about how excited and, in, uh, and interested he was in the action and in. He, he's known to have read greatly about military strategy. Yes. We know that he enjoyed the action in uh, the Netherlands in uh, 1799. 
we know that he, when he was in Canada, he was writing back to his brothers, he was writing to the Admiralty and to the, to the Duke of York, petitioning to try and have himself moved to the European theatre of war because he wanted to soldier, he wanted to do the job of a soldier. Quite, he, quite. Was, he was frustrated in Canada because he didn't feel there was much for him to do when there was so much happening in Europe. Do you feel that writing, or reading rather, and researching the campaigns of others, the history of others, helped him throughout his career? Almost it would so, wouldn't it? Almost certainly. Well, there's a direct correlation between the bluff that Nelson played at Copenhagen mm. and the bluff that Brock played at Detroit. The idea that you have a, a force that is, is hasn't probably doesn't have a chance of a genuine victory um, a, a significant victory in terms of numerical supremacy and yet by bluff and cunning and, uh, and, and intrigue he's able to sew and weave a thread which is exactly what Nelson did at Copenhagen when the battle was at its, at its highest both sides were suffering great losses and Nelson sent a, a message to the Prince of Denmark to say you can see the battle's going badly for you we're on top why don't you surrender now and you know actually if it had probably gone on another half hour <laughs> Nelson could well have been in a lot more trouble and, and it's, it's, a, it's a classic moment Brock was there at that battle he was in the HMS Ganges with his with his troops from the 49th who were acting as marines and he understood he saw that and I'm pretty sure that influenced what happened later Good. I personally speaking I feel that he was a man we would describe as ahead of his time the use of strategy the use of bluff uh, the reading and researching he was probably more learned I think than many of his contemporaries would, would that be true he wasn't he wasn't book schooled in the sense that he hadn't Quite. He, had, he had had a reasonably formal education up to the age of 15 but he had he was self-schooled in terms of his mm. love of books his love of reading and we know that in his time in Canada he spent a huge amount of that time reading books, reading uh, the art of war and such things, understanding what history was going to teach him about how to act. And of course, in those days, military warfare and military strategy was very similar to times back in medieval times and beyond into the Greco-Roman periods where armies would simply rank up against each other and fight across a field. Things have changed now and we have you know, inter intercontinental ballistic missiles, we can fire, fight battles from many hundred miles away. It's not necessarily about numerical strategy, numerical supremacy or about, new, about strategy moving troops on the ground. It's, it's more about technology now to a degree and I think when we look back at Brock, he was someone that knew his history, he knew his military strategy and I think that was what gave him the confidence to do what he did in, in Canada. Yeah, he, he was by all, all appearances very decisive and very bold, I would think. It certainly strikes me as being... Absolutely. He went against the grain because he was told to do certain things, follow certain paths, which he chose not to. That's right. I think he, he understood uh, what he was facing in terms of defending the colony, mm. and he understood that if he was facing an, an, a frontal attack from a, a foe who may not be as experienced but would certainly have numerical supremacy, he was going to have a very difficult time to do that, and especially in the climate with uh, people from who had moved from America into the Canadas. He had experienced the difficulty with the Parliament in Upper Canada, trying to move the Militia Act through. People were resisting it. They didn't feel that there was much to fight over. And actually, his his action, his decisive action, gelled the people together in that way. It helped them to see that actually America could be beaten, but they had to be beaten on Canadian terms, on British terms, not on American terms. The fight had to be taken on, on, on their own terms, not on the American terms. Yes, I, I, I really believe that uh, he was a man apart. If you follow the other campaigns, Wellington, of course, was a very good strategist in his right, but he was in Europe. Uh, there were no giant-sized figures before Brock's arrival, I don't believe, were there in Canada that I'm aware of. Other, other than in the period of the American Revolutionary Wars when obviously the British were retreating into back into Canada in that sense, the time that they spent in Canada, I, I, the, the, the generals' names that come up, the administrators' names that come up are, are people that 
later had an opportunity to, to show bold strokes, decisiveness, and, and generally didn't seem to. Um, there were some that tried to make headway into America, um, and <laughs> when faced with, with dominant uh, resistance, they simply fell back and, and withdrew. And it's, I think with, with greater spirit, the war could have been carried out in a different way, and possibly the terms of the treaty brought together in a, in a more positive way at the end of the war. Yes, I can see that. Um, any indication that uh, the general knew the French language, even a little? Oh, without a doubt. Growing up in Guernsey for the first years of his life, he would have been immersed in, in the French language, albeit uh, the Norman French that mm. the Guernsey people used. That may well have helped him when he went to uh, Canada, yeah. particularly his time in Quebec and Montreal. He would have been experiencing in social circles and in diplomatic circles French-speaking Canadians, and he would almost certainly have been quite comfortable talking to them. Yes. Yeah. Based on the bailiff's speech last night and the um, very warm welcome given to his surviving <laughs> brother, does that mean that the general had a brother actually on service in Canada at the same time as him, or did his brother follow later? I believe his brother followed later. One of his brothers actually died um, in, a, in a duel in, Cape, in the Cape of Good Hope, um, much, much, well, much later, in fact. Yes. But, uh, no, I, to be honest, I don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't say yeah, that. I just wondered, yeah. Mm. I, rather, I thought it was a very good speech last night and had many interesting things to say. I would imagine Brock was well received in the French Canada simply because he could uh, relate to people. I think so. Similar language and dialect. It would have been easier for him than I think than any other. British officer with no exposure to French people. I think so, almost certainly, yes, yes. Was Guernsey then more heavily French speaking in his day than it is now? Oh, entirely. The, the entire legislation was, the legislative assembly was, it was carried out in French, all the records were recorded in French. It was only really correspondence with England that was carried out in English, and obviously the merchant families did no learnt English in order to trade sensibly with the south coast of England um, and across into the Americas and into the, uh, across the Atlantic, but certainly the, the dominant language of the day would have been French. Yes. And the decision to send the general to school in Southampton, for instance, strategic reasons perhaps? Um, the decision to send to I would have said is probably to do with, with improving his English and improving his, his relationship and understanding of the English people because Guernsey was culturally quite different at that yes, time um, and so to, to spend time in England, to school in England for a period would have, would have set him up well to understand the way that the English system worked mm. the, in the differences that we've had from Guernsey. Yeah, that, that, that does uh, come to mind. Yeah. What about his ability to, um, again relating to people, if his soldiers from the 49th, after he had left their command and gone on to the general staff and become a general himself, and the report that he's, he was cheered by his men, what does that tell you about his basic character? He had to be somewhat a nicer person, a better person than some of the commanders who went before him, I would think. I think he was a highly respected officer, without a doubt, and I think he, Good. he was very fair to his men. Yeah. He, expressed, he expressed regret when he... Uh, dealt with deserters and when he dealt with mutineers, uh, he expressed certainly he's known to have expressed great regret at the, at the hanging of uh, a number of his men um, in Montreal after they had to be, to be deserted and been caught and mutinied rather than fought against Shafe. And he had caught them and he had rounded them up and sent them for a trial. They were tried and executed, and he, he expressed great regret at that because he felt that he had a responsibility to make sure that the soldiers were given a, 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 a decent life and that they wouldn't feel the necessity for mutiny. And so when that happened, then, you know, it's very clear that he regretted it. Um, having said that, he was very firm with them, and he, they, he wanted them to know that if they did break the rules, they would be dealt with. And I think people in history that you see who are fair but firm mm -hmm. are often the most respected. Yes, they are. I, I would say so, yeah. yes. So that mutiny uh, you've just described clearly was not against him. It was against another officer, I take it. Schaefer was known to be quite a, a disciplinarian. Um, a martinet of sorts. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yes. And uh, there, was, there was definitely a sense among his men that if they could, if they could remove him from command, then they, they may get somebody that was much more more lenient with what they were wanting to do. And of course, these are soldiers, these are probably uneducated men, these are soldiers who are in a country far from home, 
they're without their families in many cases and they are they, they have very little to do for these years mm. before the war started they mm. have very little to do there was little to keep them busy so uh, to, 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 to develop people in a way that may, gives them makes them give a positive contribution in that environment is very difficult so, 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 people have a different character and they rub up the wrong way then